Um, so I wanted to take you through, um, this isn't gonna be quite as technical as some of the other talks, this is more about um, our journey in finding the right tools, using the right processes, um, and ultimately getting the most out of the um, technologies that we really enjoy every day to empower our people. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to is can people do their work, do they enjoy it, and can they really move the ball forward? Um, so to start, I think it's really good to give you context on Red Ventures. Um, from the outside, it's kind of hard to get your arms around, um, but Red Ventures is a, um, a, really has one common theme, trying to help consumers find products and services in various different categories. So health, education, finance, um, home, communications. Red Ventures has brands in a lot of these spaces and aligned with those industry groups, we actually have um, independent, independent functions. So there are teams dedicated to health. There are teams dedicated to um, finance. Um, what I support is actually a little bit different than that. Um, I help support a group of uh, marketers at Red Ventures that actually serve as a marketing agency model. So Fortune 500 companies will come to us and say, we'd love if you can help us optimize our on-site experience, our Google search, our display advertising. So we, from soup to nuts, will manage the um, full chain of uh, data ingestion, optimization, campaign management, creative, all of those bits. So, um, and, that, and that part of the company is called Red Digital. So when I am speaking about any of these decisions, it's really focused exclusively on uh, Red Digital and that paradigm of we have to work directly with those clients who are asking us to run their marketing on their behalf. So to give you a sense of scale of Red Ventures as a whole, um, back to that image before, we've got more than 100 sites that we own and operate, plus ones that we manage on behalf of our clients. We're talking about 750 million users a month unique um, a billion events a day, 30 plus paid media channels across display, video, um, social, um, more and more platforms every day where we're buying advertising, placing organic, uh, where we're interacting with consumers trying to help them find the brands that we're, we're trying to drive forward. Um, and really at the crux of that, none of this would be possible at this scale without what we're doing with Databricks. If, we have, if you have data in your title at Red Ventures, you're using Databricks. So going back to 2020, um, thinking about what our stack was at the time, uh, we have some pretty standard things on the ingest. We're dealing with paid social, paid search, um, some call data, on-site event data, email data, um, you know, standard, standard for marketing, you're running, running optimization for uh, on-site experiences and on the advertising upstreams of that. Uh, for ingestion, we're using Databricks um, to move and manipulate a lot of that data coming in, uh, EC2 and Lambda, depending on the nature of the data. Um, storage, we're almost exclusively, at this point, a Redshift and S3 shop um, in early 2020. Uh, transformations, again, Databricks is doing most of the heavy lifting. That's, that's why we, we draw it. We have so many events, so many users. We want to build a giant machine learning model. We need the compute, distributed compute to leverage that. And then on the output, um, we're interacting with those platforms again. We're optimizing the uh, ad spend. We are um, picking the right creative based on down funnel performance. Uh, we're building reports. We're building custom machine learning models. Um, so this, this is kind of where our stack was. And um, in many ways, it was working. But with all things, um, it can always be better. There were a few recurring concerns that um, with, in combination with uh, people kind of receding back to their homes and work from home starting and beginning of the pandemic, um, that we noticed a few threads starting to, to come undone that we, we were concerned about. First, and this was a big one, um, every time we brought in a new paid media channel, we spent 100 hours of engineering time, every client, every channel. Didn't matter if we'd seen it before, didn't matter if we've uh, worked with a partner before, 100 hours to ingest Facebook data every time, every client. TikTok, Snapchat, didn't matter. It was, we were repeating ourselves and we were never getting any faster. 
And from, a, uh, from an engineer's perspective, this is pretty mechanical work. Here's an API, I need to store it in a table. So it, it wasn't necessarily the most fulfilling um, experiential time for those engineers. Um, another concern, uh, we actually saw a lot of, literally hour by hour, um, our engineers are getting drawn into these data quality issues. So more than half their time was either answering questions like, hey, my report's late, can you, can you help me track that down? Um, data's missing, why, why? Can you help me tease out the region? What's the origin of that? And then even just questions of like, even questions of how did this data even arrive here? What is the, how is this field calculated? How do, how do we build this report and send it to the client? Just questions around transparency. So in addition to that rote, repeated work of ingesting data from platforms and, and, and manipulating it into standard ways, um, we, we were losing a lot of time to these data quality concerns. So our engineers, as a result, stretched thin and very stressed. And so um, at a company like ours, where marketing requires um, clean, ingestible data that, is, that can be used to optimize upstream, this was a problem. We were losing engineers. Um, there would be some times where like, one engineer would put in some heroic effort to really get things going, and then six months later, they're burned out and they're gone. So really, at the root of all of these problems, uh, it's, a, it's a people problem. We had a scenario where we were asking too much of our engineers on things they didn't necessarily want to be working on, and we needed to find ways to work against those problems. So these, this is the, the approach we took. We, um, we, we know, identified some key problem areas we were concerned about, uh, and then we were thinking about what tools do we need, how can we make sure that the decisions we make are repeatable, and then how do those decisions ultimately empower the people we have at Red Ventures? So I already mentioned this. We had repetitive efforts on data ingestion and, and, and uh, transfer. Um, engineering time was a bottleneck, and data quality issues. So, Given that, we took a look at the, the universe of the, the modern, data space, modern data stack and um, evaluated a bunch of tools. And so um, you know, many of these are vendors you've seen downstairs. Um, and, and we really tried to bucket this in a couple groups based on the, the needs we had identified. Um, ingestion, uh, we looked at a number of tools, Fivetran, Stitch, Airbike, Gravity, um, Y42, um, all geared towards solving that problem of hey, I'm a marketer, I want to start spending money on Snapchat, and I want to build reports off of it. How can I do that quickly? So if I have to go to an engineer to pull down a custom report off their API, that's going to take dev cycles. If it is something where I can go into UI and with a few buttons start to ingest that data, that's something that's uh, going to accelerate the rate we can move on behalf of our clients. Um, we looked at some different storage options based on our client needs. Some contracts require us to be on different clouds. Um, for transformation, uh, this was more on the transparency side of the house. We wanted to make sure that a marketer could actually come in and say, answer for themselves, how did this table get created? What are the upstream dependencies? How can I tell what the origin of this column is? Um, on the output side, we actually need to interact back with those platforms. So back to that optimization piece. These are feedback loops. We're getting data from Facebook, we're op analyzing it, we're enriching it with what we have, and then sending that data back to that platform so we can encourage that feedback loop of get, bringing the consumers in at, at, a, at a good price point for our clients. Um, and that, that we brought in, looked at other tools for that. Um, you know, Kind of supporting the, that sort of primary flow we looked at orchestration tools. Uh, we had come to find that a lot of those data quality issues or reported delays were actually related to scheduled jobs. Someone was trying to schedule a job at 7 a.m. that needed to be done by 9, but it was 9.15 and all of a sudden every downstream job failed and no one knew why. Um, so we looked at orchestra orchestration tooling to, to kind of tighten that lag and, and re remove that slack in the system so we had fewer of those concerns. And then, um, you know, as, as the last kind of observability piece, we were concerned about how do we let people answer questions about the quality of their data on their own? So they don't have to go to the engineer. So they don't have to go to 
um, you know, somebody with the word data in their title. They can actually say, oh, this report is delayed. I understand why. And I, I, don't, need, I don't need to inter intercede in someone else's day. So we looked at a bunch of tools, but we didn't do, in a, do it in a haphazard manner. Uh, we really wanted to focus on making this process repeatable, separating the idea that, um, yes, we can go talk to a vendor, and there's you know, inherent bias in, in, in all sorts of interactions. Recency bias. You talk to a vendor, and all of a sudden, that's top of mind. That's all you want to, you know, you, let's go with that one. Um, but instead, we wanted to make sure that our decision-making process was um, designed in such a way that we had to really thoroughly think through all the alternatives and, and, and what we cared about and why. So we tried to be very systematic about it. First, starting with um, all the capabilities of the tooling. What problem did we want to solve? If it was, um, if there are 100 features but only two of them matter to us, well, we don't, look, we don't need to evaluate those other 98. Uh, it's very important that we started with a problem statement of we're trying to solve X problem. We're not looking at elements of the tool that are, that are solving these other issues. It's very specific to our need. Um, Viability. I think, um, especially in the startup space, this is really important. Um, or you know, open source or not, you know, project yourself out five years. How likely is that company going to be around? How do you know that project is going to be accessible to you? If it um, is a cool open source project, but it doesn't necessarily have a lot of you know, collaborators, it might not be the best choice for a large organization like mine. Now, if I were building something in my garage over a weekend, would I play around with a, a small open source project? But we were making decisions on five, six, seven year time horizons um, based on the contracts we were signing. So we needed to make sure that we're thinking about the long term viability of any solution we bring in house. Cost, not just, not just nominal cost. Who am I going to have to hire? Am I going to have to hire a senior engineer with 10 years experience on something X, well, that needs to get added to the true cost of a tool. Um, alternatives, you saw that up there. We just need to make sure that we're looking at the space, not just going with the, the, the shiny object in the room. Look at what's there, make sure that we understand here are multiple directions we can go. Um, failure conditions, where, where could this go wrong? If I'm about to make a decision, what is the most likely way this will, will go poorly? Is it the funding's not going to go through for the startup and they're going to go bust in a year? Is it the open source community is going to fall apart and I'm not going to be able to support it and I'm going to have to bring it in-house? Um, what are those failure conditions? Spelling them out explicitly and then trying to um, find ways to mitigate those. Skills, thinking about um, do we have the skills to actually use this tool? I think a lot of tools in the space um, just assume you have the skills in house and it'll just work. I've come to learn or come, come to believe that very rarely is that true. Like you need to be prepared to train your people on these tools. You need to be prepared. If you're making an investment in a software, you need to be prepared to help your team leverage it to get the most out of the value. Scale and growth, um, you know, a lot of these tools that are consumption based. If, let's say you make the right decision, you choose a tool and you're great at, uh, let's say, it's, you know, one, you know, one x, two x, what you're doing today. What if it goes 100 x of your usage, 200 x? Is that going to become untenable because you've made the right decision? How likely is that outcome? And then finally, um, thinking about security. Uh, since we are working on behalf of our clients and they are sending their, us their customer data, we need to be very respectful of their needs, of their customers' needs, of all sorts of privacy laws. We need to make sure that whatever tool we're using does not put us at risk, our client at risk, and their, their customers at risk. So took that list of all the things we looked at, took that list of all the questions we looked at, uh, uh, we, we asked, and um, to address these three issues, we really drew in around uh, three different tools. Uh, Fivetran was really the tool that helped us with the data ingestion portion. Uh, I can now give a marketer access to a tool with a, um, a Facebook credentials, and they can now ingest new data on behalf of our clients within minutes. I don't need to wait two cycles uh, for an engineer to come in and start hitting APIs. Um, 
kind of the constraints around engineering time. Fivetran and DBT are, are, are kind of hitting that problem from two different angles. Uh, Fivetran back from that data ingestion bit, uh, and then DBT from the transparency side. I can actually, by having things written in SQL, rather than kind of an obscure Scala Spark where it, it might have uh, maybe 10% of my, 10% of the employees at RV can read Scala, whereas 80% of the employees at Red Ventures can read SQL. And all of a sudden, now I can have a conversation with the majority of my stakeholders around, this is how this column was derived. We can actually all look at it together and say, hey, is this the right logic? Do we need to change this attribution model? Do we need to change this dollar value? Then we can all look at it together, have a common language, and, and work forward from there. And then on the data quality side, um, Monte Carlo is a tool we chose, uh, again, primarily because the power it put in the hands of non-technical users. Marketers can go in and say, I have an assumption about this data set. I want it to arrive at 9 a.m., I want it to have these fields, and I want it to have these attributes, and we can push those programmatically onto those systems without involving an engineer. And they can alert themselves, and they can take actions, and, they can, and the marketers can, again, inform themselves and empower themselves without going back to our engineers, which are our most precious resource, kind of based on the, the stress and, and um, kind of turnover we had been seeing. So that is um, kind of the process we've been going through and the tools we've been looking at, and this is where we are today. So um, ingesting more data sources, um, use, leveraging five trend and Databricks. Uh, we have adopted a more multi-cloud because of some uh, needs from our clients. Um, you know, we, we have support six different clients within my group right now, and each client has a different warehouse, uh, different storage needs. Um, our transformation, uh, DBT and Databricks are, are the two primary drivers of how data is transformed for us. Um, and then we're actually leveraging tools to um, push those uh, optimization metrics back out through tools like High Touch. Um, still using the, the Google ads of the world, the Facebook ads of the world, but, um, and um, kind of pushing that, that optimization forward. Uh, orchestration, we adopted Astronomer, an open source, or sorry, uh, you, which is a Airflow, um, hosted Airflow alternative. Um, and, or not alternative, but hosted version of Airflow, sorry. And uh, like I said before, Monte Carlo for driving uh, transparency around data quality and observability. So this is where we are today um, in terms of tooling. But to me, that's just the start. Uh, we actually have to worry about, just because you have a tool, doesn't mean it's getting used, doesn't mean it's effective, doesn't mean it's being leveraged. So that's where we really, as a team, and, and the product function at, at Red Digital, is making sure that people can leverage the tools, making sure that people can move forward and are empowered to do so. So we actually think about this in, in, in kind of a four-prong uh, way. One, which is making sure that there's content training. Um, someone needs to be able to either get in a room and get training on it or find self-service content um, and, and know what's going on with the tool. Uh, assessments, not just making sure that they have access to the tool and have access to training, but how can you validate they've actually learned something? Um, you can put you know, videos, YouTube videos in front of someone and then they may not actually draw anything in and that's not a great indicator for long-term success. Uh, controls and governance, thinking around what are the constraints we want to put on those systems. We don't necessarily want to give everybody full access to everything. We want to put naming conventions in. We want to have uh, conventions in for cost controls. We want to have all sorts of mechanisms around making sure that we are using the tools in the way we'd like to see moving forward. And then finally, thinking about the the metrics and monitoring, not just, we talked about all these things, but how do we measure it? How do we dr drive the outcomes we're looking for based on these other features? Um, so thinking about learning specifically, we got very, very tactical about this, down to the level of user stories. I want a user to be able to take this action in this system with this feature, um, and this is their role, and this is who needs to learn it, and how we're gonna teach them, and how we're gonna measure success. So every tool we bring in, very deliberate about um, 
getting down to these curated learning plans, which we then bring out. We either work with our vendors if they can help us deliver that, or we're going to build that content in-house. Uh, and then on the uh, control side, we um, were very deliberate about that documentation, say, here's the best practices for naming, and this is how we're going to do it, and the protocols if something goes wrong. And we're, we're very document heavy because uh, we, we've come to find that in a large federated organization, um, trying to schedule time with the right person who has the expertise in the tool is just not practical. So finding ways to document things and get video recordings and really try to push that knowledge out in an asynchronous way has, has been the biggest driver. And then also adding transparency around these metrics, building dashboards, making sure that people can see that this is what the high touch utilization looked like. This is what our uh, MTU usage was on Fivetran. Here's how many people logged into DBT last month. Um, really just making sure that these things are in the open, and we can show that the tools that we're choosing are driving the value we're hoping for. So that's a lot about the tools and the process and, and, and how we're empowering the people, but I want to talk about the outcomes that we really saw over the last two years. Um, you know, thinking about this, this tooling and this training, um, we're actually able to take that 100-hour process of ingesting new data sources from soup to nuts to um, down to 10 hours. So if I want to launch a new Snapchat campaign for a new client, I'm not waiting two weeks to get it done. I have it done in a week. I have an experiment. Monday to Monday, I can go to the client and say, yeah, we're ready to go. Here's your campaign, and here's your report, and um, we'll, we're ready to spend the budget. So from a marketing agency perspective, having that sort of you know, constraint of time has, or being able to constrain time on that particular the need has really allowed us to move faster. Um, on the data quality side, with these toolings, with these trainings, our engineers are now spending closer to 10% of their time resolving data quality issues. The really, um, you know, the softballs of the world where it's like, oh, this report is delayed because this upstream report is delayed, can be answered by the, the marketing, an marketing analysts themselves. Um, now our engineers are more involved with things that are not necessarily inside the observability of our existing tooling. They're worried about, oh, this is down because the Facebook API is down, and that's why we haven't ingested it. So we've been able to push more of our engineering time to kind of forward-looking tasks rather than this kind of uh, inward-looking or, or backwards-looking tasks. And then I think the most important part is our team is more empowered. Um, I really have come to value uh, the people I work with, and I think they are a fantastic, incredible group of folks. And um, just seeing how much more an individual can do with these tools and with this training and with these guardrails um, has been very, very um, just, just phenomenal to see. So uh, to give you a sense, just to, to, to close out here, here, here are the, the, over the last two years, these are the five tools that we really um, have, have leveraged the most heavily. Um, Databricks for that cost-efficient compute, Fivetran, um, that data integration has become a lot less painful and allowed us to move a lot more quickly on behalf of our clients. Monte Carlo is putting the transparency and quality of our data back in the hands of the people that need it. DBT is making sure that we can move more quickly with the data we have and transform that. And then Astronomer is making sure that we're kind of cutting slack, cutting the lag out of our systems. Um, think, kind of looking to the future, we are gonna continue this process. We, we set up this process to evaluate new things. Um, some of the areas we're looking to next are A-B testing. We have so many sites, we want to make sure that we're evaluating them consistently, regardless of the data stack. Uh, we have some clients who have different technology needs, so we need to make sure that we're all evaluating these tests in a consistent way. Um, measurement in a uh, post-cookie world, um, these marketing platforms tend to favor themselves in terms of who gets credit. Uh, as a marketing agency, we need to be more judicious about where do we allocate that dollar so that way we can drive that, that consumer behavior or, or, or bring someone in the door. So that's an area we're going to be looking at. And then collaborative analytics. So a lot of what we talked about so far has been on behalf of the engineers. But in this case, uh, we need to focus, we'd like to focus some time on the analysts. How do we make the analysts workflow more collaborative, more less with less redundant work, with um, ultimately with um, more repeatability and, and, and transparency. So 
ultimately, that's all I had, had for you all today. Um, I'll take any questions. Okay. Hey, um, why do you choose astronomer over uh, just vanilla airflow? You know, what are the positives and negatives of that? Thank you for the question. Um, so for us, it was around that total cost of ownership. When we talk about going with vanilla airflow, there is a kind of a platform cost. You have to have someone who is willing to manage the airflow instance, put up all of the infrastructure associated with. So for us, as a um, kind of a matter of headcount, uh, we chose to go with the hosted version. Um, and that's actually true for a lot of the toolings that we, we go with. It's, it's just a matter of, uh, I'm sure you've all tried to hire right now, uh, but it has been a little tight in a lot of places. So that has driven a lot of that kind of total cost of ownership um, thought process. Thank you. Uh, if you go back a slide, I think you had five core products. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how much time your engineers spend working with each of these products, or if there's any differentiation between roles and which products they're working with, and just a little bit of boots on the ground what that looks like for your engineers. Yeah, I would say the engineers are primarily on here, um, are going to spend the majority of their time with Databricks, DBT, and Astronomer. Um, our marketers are actually going to be more the power user in the five train in Monte Carlo, which is kind of part of our intended empowerment, democratization, take some of the rote repeat work off of their plates. Um, so yeah, Databricks, again, for that, that heavy compute, we're moving this you know, terabytes of data from point A to point B and conducting those transformations, DBT defining those transformations, and astronomer making sure the trains run on time. Uh, how did you get to the role of director of product management for a platform? Like, what were you doing before? Uh, saying yes to a lot of things. Um, originally, when I started Ren Ventures, I was working on our uh, machine learning um, uh, uh, machine learning application that did paid search bidding. So deciding how much we wanted to pay for a given ad, given what we know about the, the keywords and the volumes and those sorts of things. So it's, it's, it's kind of funny that a lot of these tools would have been phenomenal to use before because, um, uh, but to, to your question, um, someone, you know, you start hacking things together and people say, hey, can you try this? Hey, can you try that? And uh, a combination of just saying yes and, and evaluating these tools and, and really helping people work through the, um, really the software procurement process is, is really what drew me to it um, because I, I feel like I've come to recognize that as an engineer, there's only so much you can do, but if you can help people make repeatable collective decisions that almost had more leverage for me, um, and that's kind of what drew me to it. I don't know if that answered your question. And, and I will say that with the way Red Ventures defines product is, very different than like if I were at a startup with uh, you know we're selling something and like we're very much focused on one feature of it like we're for for me the product itself is the service we provide to our clients so I am I am focused at from contract signing all the way to um, all the way to close. What are the oper it's, it's almost more operations in that respect. Is where are the where's the lag? Where's the slack? How can we make people move faster and more effectively and more accurately? Um, this uh, more astronomer uh, question. So, are, uh, are your pipelines you know start after the data comes in or are like they are scheduled? The Do you mind repeating the question? Sorry, I had. Uh, do, do your ingestion start, um, it's, do your pipeline start uh, after the data comes in, or they are scheduled? Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. So most of, most of what we do today is batch. So uh, a lot of, it's, 
we're in the process of migrating to that full pattern where we have bulk upload of you know, five tran ingest from Facebook, all of downstream data transformation trigger. Um, but that's, that's the end state we're, we're, we're going towards. Um, a lot of what we're doing right now is actually kind of beginning with the end in mind and saying, I want to have uh, a report ready for our clients at 8.45 so we can you know, pull up the Tableau dashboard. So it's, it's more working backwards from there and, and deciding the paradigm. Hello. Um, one, one question from my side. I'm more familiar with Databricks, but in order to support this kind of implementation, uh, do you have a uh, CI/CD implementation, something like that, behind that that support put all the services up and running uh, in an end-to-end platform, just to understand better? Um, for CI/CD is is kind of fueling all of this. Uh, we have like our DBT transformations are controlled by CI/CD. Uh, is, was that the part you were focused about um, specifically? Yeah, it could be. For example, uh, just more, it's more high level, but how you are controlling, for example, the DBT and Databricks uh, implementations on your side, on your platform, in terms of migration across environments? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. So um, it's a little bit different depending on the client, but uh, we actually use Circle CI for um, a lot of our uh, Code, ma code manipulations and deployments. So our uh, Databricks jobs are all, I'm trying to, our Databricks jobs go through um, CI CD to get put into specific production folders that only systematic users can, can run on like production data. Um, it's not, it's not consistent across all of these tools. Like Fivetran, we don't have any CI CD on right now. In fact, that's something I'd like to get to, is like using Terraform operators to control what we're doing. So sorry, to answer your question better, it's a mixed bag. DBT, CI CD, like that's, that's how we manage all of our transformations. Um, Fivetran would love to get there. Databricks is kind of a, um, I, I, I don't love the solution we have today. Um, and Astronomer, I'm actually not sure. Uh, Monte Carlo, we have tried the, um, they have a feature which is, which is um, config, you know, configuration as code sort of monitors, but that actually doesn't fit really well with our end user. So if our end users are the marketers, they are not gonna go in and write YAML to like produce those things. So um, that's probably why it's a mixed bag. I actually don't think I had thought of it in like this cohesive manner of like how do I do, CI, how do we do CI CD across all of that. But it's probably based on kind of the user and like what they're, what they're used to using. Because if I say Fivetran, like I want a marketer there, they're never gonna do a YAML file to like put up some operator. Any more questions? Yes. Um, Sorry, I, I wanted to ask on the what's next slide, are there any software tools that you're considering for these? Um, yes, uh, we are, the one that's top of mind right now is um, this collaborative analytics space. Um, we are, you put me in the spot now, I have to memorize it. Um, <laughs> Hex is the one that I've played around with most recently. Popsql is another one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I have a list. I have a list, and if I could pull it up, I could you know give you eight or ten. But um, even Tableau and Power BI, and you know, it's it's some of the the more what looker more well known names is is um, is part of that. And again, we're going feature by feature. We have a very specific list of like what we want to accomplish as a as a team, and um, Looking at things in the space that that meet those criteria, but those are those are some of the options we're looking at. I'm sure it's. I know it's not all the list, uh, but you know, wasn't ready for the on the spot memorize everything you're evaluating. Yeah. Have to. Thirty seconds. Okay, so if you don't recall the tools for collaborative analytics, how about any of the pain points that you're trying to solve? Um, I'll tell you what I don't like about what's going on right now and what I want to eliminate. Um, Excel workbooks getting emailed back and forth, unversioned. 
uh, and SQL getting slacked back and forth of like, oh, did you get the re latest report? Oh, does John have it? Does Cindy have it? Like, it's, it is mildly infuriating when we can't agree on the, how the picture was created. Like, if I we're all looking at a PowerPoint deck, I want to know where that number came from. I want to know how this chart had these three lines and those three lines were created. So I want to find a way to put marketers in a place where we can transparency, just transparency in how they are creating um, those visualizations that are putting in front of clients, and that makes us accountable for. If a number gets in front of a client and it's not right and I'm not sure where it came from, I can't help you. Cool. Um, I think we still have like 35 minutes break, so if you mind, take a question oh, from my side. That's fine. Um, so you mentioned about jobs, orchestrations, airflow, astronomer, and so on. Have you, have you ever considered, for example, the uh, job scheduling, uh, the schedule, the antenna schedule with Databricks? I mean, it's a, something that is already integrated in the solution. We still use it today. We actually still use the built-in scheduling function. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we, for some, especially some of our legacy work, is, is still using that, that functionality today. Um, a, a little, sorry, I literally have my, uh, the director of data engineering here, I'm trying to like get, get hints. Um, I, <laughs> no cheating, I'm sorry. No, I, I mean, I'm just trying to understand because I work with customers and they're using Airflow for different reasons and now we are like at Databricks improving a lot the product, the job orchestrator. So I'm just trying to understand why would a customer go with an external tool um, for orchestrating what is missing with the job orchestrator at Databricks because the goal is really, the aim is really to make uh, job orchestrating with Databricks simpler. So we have everything like rerun when job failing, you can rerun it from where it failed. Well, I think to the gentleman's question before, um, I want things to chain off of ingestion. So if I'm using Fivetran for ingestion, and I you want external and also, I, okay. and I, I want I have to I have to coordinate with external resources. Yes, that's a valid point. Yeah. So it's it, scheduling with we use the scheduling internal to Databricks, and it, it does what we need it to do. But when it comes time to coordinate with external systems, especially with publishing reports, for instance, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I'm pushing things to the right place. You know. Think about a, a chain of events from Fivetran to Databricks to DBT to um, to high touch to put out to an SS, SFTP file, then maybe even like an email out to the vendor. So that's the sort of thing we're chaining together because we're thinking about what are where's our marketer spending time, and a lot of those kind of small actions outside of our systems are, are need to be included. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's completely uh, making sense for me because I find the only reason that um, maybe a user or developer today or a customer would go and use an external job orchestrator other than the internal one is exactly for this reason when you have to orchestrate different things other than Databricks. So that's completely multiple crazy. systems we can it's 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 like not self-contained to, to what we're doing in Databricks. It's a huge it's a big part of what we're doing, but it's not it's not self-contained to that. Okay. And then for for the collaborative analytics, you mentioned something about Looker. Power BI, Tableau, are you considering to have this directly built on Databricks SQL? Did you consider Databricks SQL for the collaborative analytics or? Uh, it, it's on the list. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> um, still still kind of going through that process and um, uh, what one of the concerns we have there um, is actually the more code heavy the option or the, mo the more it feels like coding, the less our marketers tend to want to gravitate towards it. So we're really kind of fighting this tension of um, it needs to be easy, but it needs to be powerful. And so uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm willing to bet that the options that Databricks has will check the boxes, but it's also a little bit of like hearts and minds. How do we get them to adopt the thing yeah. we want them to use? Yeah. I mean, the usage of Databricks SQL is really for, let's say, SQL proficients, like for SQL developers. But if you have users that would be really going with BI tools for drag and drop and really for the easy solution that they can always uh, plug uh, their favorite, favorite BI tool on Databricks SQL, and then you can benefit from simplicity and easiness of use, but also behind uh, from um, performance and accelerating and caching and so on. So yeah, glad you're considering this as a solution. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for those insights. Um, was really interesting, at least for me. <laughs> I hope for the others as well. Um, so you have a break, 30 minutes, and then we come back for the rest of the sessions.